In this edition of Art Rocks, a painter who believes art can be a bridge between cultures. I don't know what my style is, but what I think I do is that I mix the Latin American colors with some of the Native American. A sculptor recreates his memories in clay. My mind could do a lot of things once I got the clay in my hand. It just occupied my time. We learn about the Western art of rawhide braiding. It's a very detailed and a very precise art. And see why glass blowing is so rewarding for one artist. What I like to do is create colored glass objects that take on their own dimension. It's all ahead on this edition of Art Rocks. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello, I'm James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads Magazine, and this is Art Rocks. We begin our show today with a painter from Covington, Louisiana, who enjoys painting indigenous peoples. Luz Maria Lopez is originally from Honduras and her paintings are filled with Mayan and Aztec faces that reflect the history of her homeland. My name is Luz Maria Lopez. I grew up in Honduras and by the time I was three or four years old, I went to live with my grandmother. My first exposure to art I always felt was the altar that she had in, their ho in her home because she had prints of Renaissance paintings. The images that I paint don't have any religious meaning to me. They are just beautiful things that um, it's like a mandala. When I look at them, it just, you know, it's the colors and everything in it just reminds me of those times with my grandmother. But it's all to honor her because I felt I owe it to her because I left her. She sacrificed herself. She was the one that brought me to my dad for him to send me to the United States. I don't know what my style is, but what I think I do is that I have mixed the Latin American colors with some of the Native American uh, tradition. I like to paint indigenous things, mostly the Mayas because of the Mayan influence in Honduras. I don't have a, 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 a picture, a finished picture in my mind when I start painting. I just know that I want to paint an iconic woman that's going to be a stick, and I start painting a face. I've always said uh, over the years that what is important to me is that my art will be a bridge between the cultures. And I just wanted to uh, I realize that we are more alike than different as people. We are humans, we are universal, and the arts have always been a medium to bring beauty and unity to the human race, and I wanted to convey that too. But I feel that one of the roles of an artist is to pass our work to the future generations so that they can be inspired to do better work than what we're doing, and that's how the artist, the art gets better and better. And you know, that is, is a food for the soul, and I hope that what I do will be
To see more of her work, visit luzmarialopez.com. Now, let's take a look ahead at some of the arts and cultural events coming up soon around Louisiana. For more information on these events, visit the website at lpb.org slash artrocks. And you can find more arts connections at countryroadsmag.com. Gary Dutley, a ceramic artist, grew up with clay in his hands. Now it's his passion. He takes memories, turns them into sculptures, and then casts them in bronze. Let's watch as Dudley takes us through his creative process. Hi, I'm Gary Dutley. I work on the name Garley. I'm a sculptor. Well, my first experience was my mother was, uh, she did ceramics. So I used to travel with her just to carry her stuff. I'm eight, nine, she just dragging me along. I don't want to go. So once she gets to where she's doing her work, the way she used to keep me quiet was to just give me some clay. But I just remember the first time she gave me the clay was just an amazing thing for me because my mind could do a lot of things once I got the clay in my hand. It just occupied my time. And so everything went silent for me at that point. I grew up in Portsmouth, Virginia, segregated at the time. And believe it or not, a lot of people don't understand that even in segregation, there is, the culture is just a beautiful culture. So a lot of things in my mind, I like to remember by sculpting how beautiful people seemed to me, even in a time where you would think it would be the culture itself, just look at the, the underlying part of culture, just families, families that go to church, families that, you know, raising their kids to go to school, and that's the part I remember, that's the part I'm trying to capture. In some cases, it's just pushing on the clay. Sometimes, sometimes I don't have an idea. Sometimes I'm pushing on clay, and then the idea comes to me. Other times, uh, like, like the piece uh, that I used my daughter as the model, Sunday's Flower. When I started that piece, I didn't have my daughter in mind, actually. But I needed a child's face, and my daughter was five at the time, and I went, that face will work for me. And that was a tough one, because she, she was five, and the only way I could get her to sit still was to put cartoons on. The skateboarder is a little bit different, uh, because I've had Someone sent me a photograph uh, of a skateboarder, and I, and I just, I looked at that and I said, that's a dynamic piece. Someone asked me, do you plan your sculptures? Well, yes, but those plans usually <laughs> go out the window. Do you draw a picture of your sculptures? I did that in the beginning where I said, okay, I'm gonna sketch this part and then put this together. But what happens is, for me, I was struggling trying to stay in the sketch. I want people to just come in and go, I like it, I don't like it, and it's okay not to like it. Move on and then find something you do like. That's, that's what art is. Don't try to judge what someone else is saying art is. And that's, I think, that's where we are today. A lot of times someone else is waiting for someone else to tell them whether or not they like this piece of art. Is that okay? It's okay if you feel that, if you like it, it's okay. For me, uh, when I started it, it was just a success already. And yes, you know, you want to have all the actors, you want to be the great artist, and, and that's, I'm still working on that. But most artists would tell you when they create, that's a success. To be able to just start something from nothing and to make it happen is just a great feeling. Everything else after that is icing on the cake. 
To see more of Dutley's sculptures, visit garelysculptures.com. The Western art of rawhide braiding might be dying out, but for Tim George, a master of the craft, it's still very much alive. Take a look at his detail-oriented art. This is a calf hide that's been made into rawhide. And we'll start cutting a string around in a circle about one and a quarter inches. My name is Tim George. I'm a rawhide braider and I've braided for over 35 years. We're going to have to reintroduce moisture to it so that I can cut it. And it'll take about three days before it's ready to cut. When I was a young man, I started to buckaroo. And I met a man, Red Oster, who repaired saddles and did some simple braiding on the side. And one day he was in there braiding a riata. And every time he'd go to pull a string tight, he'd bump into me. And he said, if I was going to stand around here in the way, I might as well learn something. OK, once our hide is ready to cut, first what we're going to do is we're going to start splitting it down or bringing it into one consistent thickness. And we're going to use the old Osborne 86 here. I grew up in Elkton, over on the Oregon coast. And then when I came over to Eastern Oregon in 75, I just fell right into it, and I've been there ever since. But when I go to the coast, a depression sets on me. And it's not until I come back over the mountain, I feel my whole body just go, <sighs> I'm home. This is my country. Still, Tim hasn't left the ocean behind entirely. Western rawhide braiding grew out of the knots sailors have been tying for centuries. And folks in Pendleton will tell you that Tim makes some of the finest examples of the work anywhere. Braiding is not uncommon. If you go to Southeast Oregon, uh, Paisley, Fields, uh, Jordan Valley, that kind of country, you see people braiding. Tim has taken that cowboy art to the, to the ultimate level. I don't believe there's, there's more than 10 people in the world that can braid at the level that Tim does. Like the sailors before them, original rawhide braiders took up the craft out of a practical need. Most of it was developed by the vaquero, coming up through Argentina, Mexico. Whenever they had time off in the evening or whatever, let's say they wanted to plait a rope, if they had a need for a head stall, a set of reins, then they would just sit down and basically make the functioning pieces that they needed. The material to make the gear was also ready to hand. Rawhide is merely the cowhide, an elk hide, horse hide, with nothing more than the hair and the flesh removed, where leather is a chemically treated process. And rawhide is 10 times stronger than leather is. It won't dry rot. It'll stay in this condition literally forever. This practical craft evolved into an art form, and most of Tim's work now goes straight to collectors. We're now going to split it down to a 32nd of an inch. This is a 32nd of an inch, and then we'll cut you one a 64th of an inch. Tim's renown is earned by the care he takes with every step of this demanding process. Now we're ready to bevel the edge of the string. And this just takes that little sharp edge off. The string is too small to run through the splitter, so Tim does this step by hand. Just to be clear, that string is a 64th of an inch wide. Okay, at this point, it too is ready to be braided into knots. Say, could you do that with your left hand? Yes, ma'am. Now, this is pure showmanship here. You did that with your left hand. Well, that's what you wanted. <laughs> 
As exacting and exhausting as the process is already, it's all still just preparation for the actual braiding. Today, Tim is braiding a quirt, a Spanish-style flexible whip. The barrel of the quirt is 24 strings, and then we have these series of knots, and so we might take it to an under four, over four. They're here, we're actually up over seven and eight strings. Okay, now at this point where we're starting to raise it from under one over one to under two over two, or we're simply increasing the diameter of the knot. Now that we're going under three, we're gonna go over two under one. If you're lost already, you'll be forgiven, but Tim insists that it's actually pretty simple. The Turk's head is the foundation of all of these knots. I can increase it, to a larger Turk's head, or at this point, I can start interweaving it. Let me do it left-handed too. Very funny. But even if rawhide braiding is simple enough to do with your non-dominant hand, Tim is the first to admit that this art form is not for everyone. It's a very detailed and a very precise art. If you don't love working with your hands, you don't have the time or the patience, you simply aren't going to make it. So I really have to focus on what I'm doing to be able to keep everything straight, get everything to fit like it is without making any mistakes. So what happens when he does make a mistake? <sighs> Not only can I tie sailor's knots, I can cuss and curse like one too. <laughs> Tim is a master of the classical Western style but he's also pretty handy at the South American gaucho style. This kind of braiding requires a tool known as a fid to separate the fine strings as Tim braids them. The gaucho style is more artistic than ours, but it doesn't have the durability that ours does because of the fineness of the string. And then, of course, if it gets flipped over, you gotta pull it out and start all over again probably aren't going to want to stay here until this is done because we'll be at it for several hours. <laughs> this art form takes time. And it might be for this reason more than any other that it's now in danger of dying out. We're in a computer age. We want it now. We've got to see it now. We don't have the patience that a craftsman needs. We just don't have that anymore. For Tim George, Eastern Oregon's open spaces and more relaxed pace of life are the ingredients he needs to keep this vanishing art form alive. To me, it's worth the time. I just love working with my hands and the idea that I take a cowhide and make an article that is going to last a long, long time, be here long after I'm gone. Each week on Art Rocks, we celebrate and examine another of Louisiana's treasures, an artistic or cultural element with a unique connection to Louisiana. This week, let's explore shadows on the tech. In New Iberia, under the shadows of towering live oaks that encircle it, a 180-year-old antebellum home lies along the banks of Bayou Teche. Built by David and Mary Weeks, who were wealthy sugarcane planters in the region, the Shadows was a second home, a town home, to accommodate the entertainment and social life of a wealthy family. The three-story brick building, in the classical revival style, features eight white columns along the facade, which support an expansive veranda. Upon its completion in 1834, Mary Weeks and her six children moved in. Her husband David, who had been chronically ill as the home was built, was traveling in New England seeking medical advice. Tragically, David Weeks died in Connecticut, away from his family and before ever spending a single night at the shadows. Mary Weeks went on to manage the plantation and was also responsible for the welfare of the slaves, over 150 men, women, and children. She remarried a lawyer, John Moore, but a marriage contract kept her children's property separate as allowed by Louisiana law. William Weeks, the oldest son of David and Mary, eventually took over management of the family sugar plantation. 
John Moore became a judge and a U.S. congressman. In 1861, he was a delegate to the Louisiana Convention that voted to secede from the Union. The plantation economy depended upon Louisiana slavery, and Judge Moore and Mary Weeks Moore supported the political changes they saw necessary to save it. During the Civil War, most of the Weeks family evacuated the shadows, but Mary remained, along with a sister-in-law and three slave house servants. In November 1863, federal troops occupied the outbuildings and ground floor of the plantation home. Mary Weeks and the others sequestered themselves in the family rooms on the second and third floors. Before the year's end, Mary died in her sleep and was buried on the grounds. Her presence at the shadows probably saved the property from further damage and confiscation. The federal troops moved on within a few weeks, and the Civil War ended not long afterward. When William Weeks returned to the shadows as manager of the plantation, he was forced to strike an agreement with the newly emancipated men and women of color. Over the next half century, the Weeks family remained at Shadows on the Tesh, as it became known, but as the family's fortunes slipped away, they sold off much of the land surrounding the plantation home to meet expenses, and the town of New Iberia began to close in around the stately structure. When William Weeks Hall, the fourth generation great-grandson of David Weeks, became the owner, the mansion was in serious decline. Weeks Hall, trained as an artist, spent the rest of his life restoring shadows on the Tesh. He realized early on that the legacy of his family and the preservation of the grand plantation home were his responsibility. One of his passions were the magnificent gardens surrounding the home. To keep the encroaching city at bay, he planted a bamboo hedge edging the property and created garden rooms under the grand live oak trees. He also began searching for a national organization to accept the house and ensure its preservation. A colorful, even eccentric character, Hall engaged the wealthy and famous of his day, inviting them to his home, where many left their signatures. Henry Miller, Cecil B. DeMille, Emily Post, D.W. Griffith, and Walt Disney. All were charmed by his personality and impressed with his preservation efforts. The National Trust for Historic Preservation partnered with Weeks Hall and accepted the estate shortly before his death in 1958. The trust also received the historic Weeks family papers of 17,000 items, making it one of the most documented historic homes in the country. Preserved in trunks in the attic were linens, furnishings for the home, and family clothing, providing a complete picture of life at the shadows. The National Trust oversaw renovations and opened the site to the public in 1961. They received over 25,000 visitors annually. Shadows on the Tesh was named a National Historic Landmark in 1974 and remains a treasure to the town of New Iberia and to Louisiana. The art of glass blowing is more complex than one may think. Artisan Stephen Monser observes that unlike painters who can paint, stop and come back to their canvases later, glass blowing is a time sensitive art. What I try to do is in my own way, I'm not trying to recreate the wheel. It's already it's been done. What I like to do is create colored glass objects that take on their own dimension. I look into the, the vat of clear 2100 degree glass, and it's sort of like a palette. It can be anything you want it to be. It can be a, a vessel, it can be a plate, it can be a bowl, it can be a paperweight. You can take clear glass and it's all around us all day long people don't even notice glass and just turn into something that's really beautiful really amazing I don't know how else to describe it it's just so rewarding when it comes out with a finished product and you can really be proud of it glass is very delicate you have to to bring it up to temperature very slowly so it takes about 24 to 26 hours to get it up to 2100 degrees it's a process a fire pit keeps it hot. It's sort of like a drippy honey type thing on the pipe. You take it to the bench, you work it, and as it cools, you have to reheat it so you can work it again. It goes from 2100 down to say 1400 where it won't work anymore, and then you have to reheat it. 
the add color, and your finished product ends up in an, what we call an annealer, which will take about 12 hours to cool it down to room temperature so it doesn't crack. It sounds involved, but there's a method to each piece. Focus is really important because you're focusing on what you're doing and then you also have to remember what comes next. And you really have to pay attention because we're working with 2,100 degree glass. And so you have to, in a way, try to relax mentally, but on the other hand, you're given a certain amount of time, about a minute and a half to work it. So there's the coordination of patience, but hurry up because it's getting cold, that type of thing. To me, glass blowing is very rewarding because it takes so long to do, so long to learn, and there's so much involved, and I think that's what draws me to it. It's not the simple, sometimes I envy people that can just paint because you can take your easel and just paint and you can stop and come back. Where this has a little more complexity to it, which is probably why I'm drawn to it more. My parents took me to the Corning Museum of Glass when I was a kid and we had colored glass in the house and for the windows and it just, that experience kind of stuck with me for quite a while and um, I've always been drawn to it. Some people ask me what it's like to blow glass or what it feels like and, and it's really a hard thing to describe how, how it feels and I, I say, well, have you ever seen a dog with his head out the window? That's sort of what it feels like. You can't really explain it but it's just a very good feeling of doing it. When Stephen Monser isn't making glass pieces, he teaches others the art of glass blowing in Central Florida, north of Orlando. Well, that wraps up another edition of Art Rocks. Don't forget, you can check us out anytime online at lpb.org slash artrocks where, besides feature videos, you'll also find information on upcoming arts events throughout Louisiana. Until next time, I'm James Fox Smith, and thanks for watching.